Wendy Weckmeyer, great to see you and uh, congratulations on your book award, a finalist in the Lieutenant Governor Historical Writing Award from the BC Historical Federation for this book. Uh, how do you feel about that? I'm very honored and very pleased, especially to get this award from the BC Historical Federation. I mean, the BC's historians, it's, it's wonderful. And I really want to thank all of them. And I want to mention it's not the first to really acknowledge Tate. You gave the award, your organization gave the award to Judy Thompson for her book, Recording Their Story, another book on Tate. It's, it's something that, that your book does is bring this remarkable man to the rest of us. Many British Columbians don't really know who he was, but uh, w when you look at him a century later, he was really in the vanguard of, of relationships between settler and, and Indigenous communities. And could you tell us just about where he came from and how he came to arrive in Spence's Bridge? Well, he was 19 uh, and living in Shetland, in Lerwick, Shetland in 1884, and he had an uncle, I'm glad you should use that photo because the uncle actually ended up uh, purchasing a big piece of land. You can see it on the left side, or just at this, the left side of the bridge, it was John Murray. And he had a trade store there in a hotel. And he sent a letter to his, uh, his sister in Shetland and said, if you have any kids who, who wanna to come to British Columbia and work in my trade store, I have a job for them. So Tate responded and it was 1884, he was 19 and he made the long trip from Shetland across the Atlantic, across by train to the West Coast and up to uh, Spence's Bridge, which looked like that in 1884. And totally immersed himself in, in the community, didn't he? Uh, and, and working at the general store would do that in part, but he also connected uh, with the local indigenous community and uh, took uh, a indigenous woman as his wife. His life exploded uh, at, from age 19 until he died at age 58, right here at Spence's Bridge, exploded in so many directions, it's hard to sort of rope them all in. Um, but marrying and meet, meeting and marrying Antco, who was from the local reserve, just above that piece of land that I just mentioned on the left, um, opened a whole world to him. He uh, bonded with her community. They ended up marrying and, and, and acquiring a piece of land adjacent to her reserve. It was the Cook's Ferry Band all through there. And uh, just dove into her language, dove into deep conversation, deep relationship with her people, with her, her relatives uh, on a level that I don't think we really have for British Columbia, certainly for the late 19th century and early, tw early 20th century. And that led to just sort of a huge relationship and huge exchanges, uh, deep exchanges on you know politics and all sorts of uh, important issues for that period. An incredible research uh, as an ethnographer, and he I believe learned three of the uh, Southern Interior languages. He he totally immersed himself in the culture, and shared that with uh, a famous anthropologist, Franz Boas. Yes, he's an important character in my story and certainly an important uh, figure in the Tate uh, story. He arrives by train. Now the CPR is just pushing its way through just as he arrives in 1884, that's important. In 1886, it's made its way through. 10 years after he had been there in 1894, this anthropologist, Franz Boas, who was uh, a new immigrant at that stage from Germany trying to sort of make his way into a North American institution, ideally a museum or a university, passed through and he was doing contract work and somebody sent him up that side hill in that photograph to, to meet uh, James Tate. He wasn't having good luck at doing his, his anthropological work in the region, mapping the cultures, uh, part of his job was to measure the local indigenous peoples along the way. Anyway, he, someone sent him up to meet, the, the, the first sent him over to meet Tate's uncle and then up the hill to meet Tate. And that, it started a relationship that lasted until Tate's death and just huge reports on every topic under the sun um, and a correspondence as, Tate, as Boaz ended up in New York City. So the links between Spence's Bridge and New York City in the story are very strong. Tate is such a fascinating character on so many levels. Uh, he's also uh, 
uh, a guide outfitter and he, he roams over much of British Columbia, but you touched on this earlier. He did come initially from the Shetland Islands. And how much did that uh, inform his empathy for Indigenous people? Because the Shetlanders themselves were, were a colonized people, weren't they? Well, I think it's major. I certainly make quite a big deal out of it in my book, and I loved the Shetland side of the research. I found that uh, Shetland being a, an island-bound culture far off the coast of northern Scotland, it's closer to Norway historically and geographically in a way than it is to the UK. So uh, Tate's generation was the first to grow, first to have, you know, uh, mandatory schooling until a much later age than it had been. And, and they were really into their roots. There was a lot going, I mean, Tate was very tracing his own family back to uh, the 15th century when Shetland had, had, been, had gone from Scandinavian, you know, Norse, um, Danish, Norwegian rule to Scottish rule in the 15th century. So they were busy sort of, that he changed his name from an anglicized spelling to this Norse spelling and they were re revering their dialect and in speaking it, which he loved, which was a language then which was very much English, but had a Norse overlay still. So he loved that dialect. He was studying Scandinavian sagas. He was very much in love with Shetland and it was a bounded culture. There had been two clearances that I think there were hearings going on around, you know, the evictions, the inequities over land, the, 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 the rule of, you know, the, the hold that the Scottish landlords had over these outer islands. They were very much into this history. And when you look at it, and then look at age 19, when he arrives here, you know, the, the land clearances that, had, that Antco's family and all these community members that he was hanging out with had experienced had, you know, I, I think there was a resonance he certainly, in his early stories he was re recording and the kinds of work that he was doing even before he met Boaz, seemed to be to be trying to understand this, this immersion in the language. Why did he do that? How many outsiders be became totally fluent in, in a language like the Nlakamak language? And gained the trust of, of the chiefs within that southern part of British Columbia. And, and you have a photograph in your book, uh, a, a couple of him with with the people that he advocated for, maybe to describe uh, who he's with here and what his role was at the time. Well, you know, as I said, he arrived in 1884, met Boaz in 1894, that opened up a whole world of ethnographic work that he was doing. And by the turn of the century, there was so much um, antagonism toward the, the settle, you know, settlement that was going on that he started to really tune into that. And by 1909, the local interior chiefs, of which these three chiefs are members, form an organization. The Niska in the North have formed an organization, the Niska Land Committee. The coastal people had a, coastal peoples had a petition going in 1909, the Cowichan Petition, under the Indian Rights Association was supporting that on the coast. And they formed another organization called the Interior Allied Tribes. So from 1909 until Tate died, well, this organization was really, um, you know, they were organizing trips, they were writing petitions, they were dealing with a, a major McKenna McBride Royal Commission that was, you know, they were, it was totally stacked against them. They had no membership on it. So these chiefs in this photograph, and one, they're all important. I just have time to sort of touch on them, on Tetlanit, John Tetlanit, who's far left, and Tate standing beside Tate. Uh, probably one of the most important political leaders of this early era, 1909. Unfortunately, he died in 1918. But when you consider what it took to get trips to Victoria to deal with Richard McBride, who didn't want to settle their question, their land question, I either been no treaties made in British Columbia beyond a few little scattered ones. And then they went to Ottawa in 1912. They went again in 1916. They went again in 19. 20, just battling the government on the land question, but also during the war, it was on the conscription question. It was on the, you know, the, the, the potlatch ban. It just was, there were so many things. The land question was huge, but these guys fought so much. And he gained their trust. And um, 
among other things, he also continued his work in, in gathering uh, information about their culture, including recording songs at a time when going out with a, a wax cylinder recorder would have been at the, uh, the head of technology, the front end of technology. And we're, we're going to play a, a brief clip from one of the songs that he recorded. Maybe you could explain. I think it was around 1915 that this was yes. recorded. So who, what do we listen for in this, in this brief clip? Tate made over 200 recordings at Spence's Bridge. People just sort of came in and sang and they talked about him and he kept notes and went up into the tall tan country and, and took the recorder up there and recorded more songs. So we have probably over 400. They're part of the Canadian Museum of History's collection. They were all sent there. But what I think you're gonna notice in this, what I want you to notice in this is just the detail of all of his notes. You'll see here that he records the name of the singer, he takes her photograph, but in detail, he records this details about the song. So you, you listen for, in this one, what he says, first of all, listen to him announcing the song, Cradle Song, which everybody today, and, and certainly in the 80s and 90s, you know, when I was tripping through that country, they all knew this song and, and sang it freely. Um, you'll hear a little trill of the song and you'll see in his notes, that are, are on the screen, just the detail that he managed to record. I want you to get the sense of for everything, whether it was plants or whether it was a buckskin drawing or rock art, it was always this level of detail. Also pay attention to his beautiful handwriting. Cradle song. <laughs> from 105 years ago, Eopatko, and, and that was a lullaby. Yes, a lullaby, he calls it, or a cradle song, and Eopatko, I feel like I've come to know her in so many, you know, we, we, most women at that stage weren't talking to men, especially, I mean, foreign outsiders, and certainly not in their languages, and, you know, it's, on these recordings, Oh, 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 there were over 30 singers and half of them were, were women. I found that just so heartening. And sometimes you hear laughter as they're sticking their heads into this big metal horn. But Yopatko turns up lots in his notes. And, and uh, this is one of his photographs of her. And she, she just strikes me as, a, as so many of these women. I feel like I've, I know them through Tate. Mm -hmm. I'd like to show another photograph that takes us to another part of the province and uh, to, to keep things going. He had a family to feed. I think he had six children. Uh, he was uh, a guide and he would travel all over the province. Where, where is this photo taken and, and what's he doing? Well, this is on the Stikine River and... Uh, far north. Far north. I mean, we're talking about trips up to, by steamship up to Wrangell, Alaska. And then at Wrangell, then you got your, your supplies and you know, a lot organized and up you went in a canoe or, or, or a riverboat. Uh, his first trip up the Stikine, which was 1904, I think it was in a canoe that he actually had purchased from Ontario and shipped up and hired a canoe guy to help him. And up they went this raging river in a canoe. Um, Tate loved challenges at once. You know, he went up in this canoe up to Telegraph Creek and then he, he organized a team of, of outfitters and, and uh, often had clients and off they went. Most falls from August till, um, August till November. There was nothing he loved better, I think, than these trips with the tall tan working on his, with him on his cruise. Um, did this also through central British Columbia. I mean, he knew so much of the province, but we have one trip where it had, the, the river had frozen before just as they were supposed to head down. And it wasn't a problem to Tate. They actually spent some time making a boat, making a scow. <laughs> well, I could do that. <laughs> and yeah. down they went. And the other, the other boat, by the way, didn't make it. He was very pleased that his did. 
there was snow. There was, there was, uh, I mean, this, he just loved the challenge. He's in a boat here, but most of the, the photographs I have of him are on horse and with his horse packing crew. Wendy, there are so many facets of the man that, that you do delve into and at the bridge. Um, his legacy a hundred plus years later, um, what do you think it is and how does it resonate now? Well, I think his legacy is huge for the Indigenous peoples, all, you know, from the tall town to all of the southern interior, the Nihilakamuk and all their neighbors, down in the U.S. where he traveled to, Washington State, Idaho, Montana, or Oregon. The notes that he left on maps, on stories, as I say, on songs, on botany, are a treasure trove today for these people because he did it with such a heart, with such a such a spirit that you don't see and and through the languages it's and as i said through the politics that informs him too these were not dead dying people whose words and whose artifacts should end up in a museum or a or or a, a textbook it was very much these are living people the outside world needed to know just the richness of their lives nobody at that stage most of these people he was dealing with were extremely articulate, but they could not speak English. They spoke multi-languages. He wanted people to be able to understand what they were all about. So to the communities today, it's a treasure trove. To the non-Indigenous, to the settler community, it's a treasure trove because we just don't have anything that I don't think as it, it's grounded in 40 years of being there in relationship, in a marriage into the community, into just, just on the land, a love of the land and an eye and a soul that sort of sees it as, I don't think anyone for this period, I mean, I know I'm hazarding a big guess here, but I really don't think we have eyes on our landscape that are like this and a relationship, which I like to think comes across in that cover of them, you know, they're talking together. This is an like Captain man beside him. They're, they're talking together, there's relationship. There's a sense of belonging in this work that I think resonates to, pe to the indigenous communities, which is so important to me. But also I think we in the settler community can gain so much by diving into this, this life and this lens. Well, congratulations once again on uh, this acknowledgement from the BC Historical Federation. It, it's a pleasure to speak with you and a privilege. And it's, it's just so sad that he died at 58. And today he probably would have survived. I think it was a bladder infection that started his, his end. But uh, he lived three or four lifetimes in, in those 58 years. It's, it's remarkable. It really so, did. Mark, I want to really thank you. You really have been such a, you've read the book so closely and you, you were one of the first to do this and I so appreciate that, that your, your questions are so, so rooted in the text. I really appreciate that and I really um, want to thank Doug Brigham too for making this all kind of yes, work. Doug right? is helping us out here with all yes. the technology behind the scenes and uh, well congratulations once again. Great to speak to you. Thank you so much.